It is a privilege and honor to be able to be your speaker one more time. And this meeting has just been awesome, hasn't it? The singing, the preaching, the fellowship, it's been an amazing meeting. And I'm thankful to be a part of it, and I'm thankful for Chapel Grove for hosting this meeting. This morning, we talked about what the Bible says about homosexuality. We learned that it's a sin, an abomination to God, and that it's us serving creature over the Creator. We learned that we are under attack and that Satan wants us to use the, this lie to divide and to destroy us. And lastly, we learned that we are not our temptations, that our identity is in Christ. Now tonight, we're going to study how to treat people who struggle with this sin and temptation of homosexuality. How to approach and even evangelize to these people that struggle with homosexuality. Sometimes we as a church of Christ can act like homosexuality is so far away from us and that there's nobody in the church that struggles with this. But that is far from the truth. Homosexuality is a real problem and it is creeping its way into the church. While we may not see it, there are Christians that struggle with this quietly and internally. And the church is not only struggling with the sin of homosexuality, but also the acceptance of it. The Apostle Paul walked the church at Corinth through this process in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And while it wasn't specifically homosexuality Corinth was dealing with, Paul says they were dealing with some pretty bad sexual immorality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, it reads, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has so done this deed. In verses 9 through 11 it reads, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then you need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, covetous, an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So let's look in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Earlier in the chapter, Paul says that they have a man at their church who has taken his father's wife and had relations with her. I mean, this is pretty bad stuff. Paul says this immorality is not even named among the Gentiles. And this man was openly living like this. And the church at Corinth was not addressing it. So here in verses 9 through 11, Paul is setting boundaries in place because of their acceptance of this man. These people in Corinth are examples to us that we should never leave sin unchecked or not dealt with at our church. If our intention is to help save them, then we can never justify their sin to them or let them continue in sin in Romans 6 1 it says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound by no means God has given us unconditional love not unconditional approval he's given us unconditional love not unconditional approval so we should never approve of something that God does not approve of we have to realize that people that are in the sin they are lost they are in sin and in need of a savior. From what I've been told by some older brethren, throughout the years, the church has usually been good at marking this kind of sin and get rid of it. In the past, the church has had to deal with all kinds of sexual morality, like fornication outside of marriage, and many different challenges that came like that. And praise God that the church has stayed strong throughout all of this. But this generation right now is being conditioned to this kind of sexual morality. So we need to learn about what the Bible says about this topic of homosexuality. Like Brother Brandon said, we need to be devoting time to learn what the Bible says about all of these topics talked about this weekend. But now, let's see how the church in Corinth handled the advice that Paul gave them in 1 Corinthians 5. Jumping to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4-8, through 8, it reads, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient 
for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought to rather forgive and comfort him. Lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. We see here that Paul tells Corinth that they need to comfort and accept the same guy they were letting run wild in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's words were that this man was about to be swallowed up with sorrow. We have to make sure we never allow that to happen to somebody. We have to make sure that if we see someone in sin, that we comfort them, reaffirm our love for them, but while speaking the truth in love, like it says in Ephesians 4, 15. And when it says comfort him, it doesn't mean comfort or indulge him in the sin that he's committing, but comfort him in the fact that he can still be a child of God. While we don't want to cover up their sin, we want to make sure that we don't make them lose hope. Because our job as brothers and sisters in Christ is to remind each other of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and his promises. Are you trying to win the argument with them or beat them over the head with their sin? or maybe make them feel accepted? Or are you trying to bring them back to Christ and help them recover from their sin? And I said it this morning, and I will say it again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to be kept. There was a study done by the National Institute of Health that showed that the suicidal rate for homosexuals or any other type of sexuality than what God intended was three to six times greater than that of the rate of a heterosexual person. When we get taken into sin, it makes us lose hope because without God, we do not have a purpose. So it only makes sense that these people struggling with homosexuality are hurting and sad and far from God. So again, let's ask ourselves, what are our intentions when talking to these people? Is it to pull them out of their sin and bring them to Christ? Or is it to completely accept them in the sinful state that they're in? So we need to do our part. And again, speak the truth in love, like it says in Ephesians 4 and 15. We need to be thinking. We need to find a way to let them know that their sin is wrong and not acceptable to God, but also that they can be forgiven. 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First off, if someone comes to you and tells you that they're struggling with homosexual temptations. Make sure that you are a safe person for them to trust and confide in. Your neighbor Billy Joe does not need to know that Brother Tim is struggling with homosexual feelings. Another point I'd like to make is that young people are not meant to be burdened with these type of things. Like Brother Aaron and Brother Marcus said Wednesday night, a teenager's brain is not even close to being developed yet. So if you're somebody who is struggling with homosexual temptations, do not put that burden on a young person. Bring it to someone who is older and more experienced and knows where to guide you. We also need to determine whether this person seriously wants help with their sin. And if they do, then you take them straight to the word of God and you help them with that sin. And if you are that person struggling with homosexual feelings, then make sure that when you confess to someone, They are safe people. And their number one goal is to get you to heaven. And the way you know that someone is safe is if they take you straight to the word of God. When people don't have somebody safe to talk to, they keep secrets. And brothers and sisters, secrets will ruin your life. They will absolutely destroy you. God made confession for us so that we don't have to live in secret. So when you've messed up and you need help, Let a safe person know and confess your sins. And we also have to make sure that we don't jump on people when they confess to us. Be the voice of reason in their lives. Imitate the voice of Christ when you talk to these people. Because they may not have someone in their life that will do that for them. Make sure you help them realize that they've taken a step out of the light. And that their next step needs to be right back in to the light. And they can do that through the power of God and through his word. When we're approaching someone struggling with homosexuality, we should not keep focusing on how broken they are. We should tell them that they can be healed. We should tell them that our God, the potter, can take something broken and mend it into something beautiful. 
Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6 says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look as the clay as in the potter's hands, so you are in my hand, O house of Israel. Our message to them should be that no matter what they've done or what they've become, God can take them and mend them into his children. Tell them that there is hope for them in Jesus Christ. Think about it this way. Everyone in this room who's lived long enough has been broken and in sin at a time in their life. <clears throat> so shame on us if we ever look down on someone and think we're better than them because of their sin. Because even if we haven't struggled specifically with homosexuality, we have all been broken and in sin before. So when they come to you with their sin, remember the moments where you were broken and you were in sin. Sympathize with them. Let them know that you are a broken sinner too and that you've messed up. While at the same time, speaking the truth from God's word in love. We have to remember when we're talking to someone who's struggling with any kind of sexual morality, we're talking to someone struggling with sin. And we need to treat them like a soul. Do not treat them like an outcast. But we need to be careful when we're talking to and helping our friends in these situations. Because people in sin will try to keep you in sin with them. When we live right, it condemns them and the sin that they're in. So we need to be ready to maybe lose a friend over this if we have to. Of course, that's not our goal. But we need to know the word of God. Stand by it and guard our hearts. Now going back to 1 Corinthians 5, it says that we should not keep company with anyone named a brother that is sexually immoral. So that begs the question, how do we help someone who is struggling with homosexuality if the Bible says we're not even supposed to eat with someone who is sexually immoral? First off, we have to determine the state of the person that we're talking to. Are they in rebellion or are they stumbling in sin? Are they completely disregarding the word of God and living the life of sin and blatant rebellion of God's word? Or are they attempting to serve him, but they fall short because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? 1 Timothy 4, 2 says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with the hot iron. We have to determine if their heart is seared with the hot iron. Are they believing the lie that we talked about this morning in Romans 1? Now, one more thing I'd like to point out is that this study of homosexuality also applies to thought behavior. Now, I'm not married yet, but for now, let's just imagine I'm married to somebody. And a brother comes up to me and tells me that they are lusting after my wife. Well, I know that I would want that stopped. And I would have the conversations and take the necessary steps to make sure that that does not happen again. Now, I want you to think in a similar way. If a brother came to you and confessed that he has been lusting after a man, we would still have to take initiative. We need to do everything we can to help these brothers and sisters that are struggling with homosexual temptations. We need to help them stop their sin in any way we can. Now to close out my whole study on homosexuality, we're gonna talk a little bit more about identity. While I'm specifically talking about homosexuality in this sermon, this applies to anyone that you know that is struggling with sin or struggling with their identity. Because homosexuality is an identity issue just as much as it is a behavioral issue. In our country, there is a hyper focus on identity. Everyone wants to be loved and accepted for who they are. They just want to fit and be a part of something important. Now, when you're talking to these people, let them know that there is a place for them. And that can be in multiple ways. First off, let them know there is a place for them in God's kingdom. They can be children of God. They can be part of something important. As young people, sometimes we just want to fit in and be a part of something important. Your message to these struggling people should be that they can be part of something important. The kingdom of the creator of the universe. We should tell them that can be their identity. Their mess ups and their past sins do not define who they are. And their gender and their temptations do not define who they are. Oh, let me clarify. Gender is a big part of somebody's identity. Our main identity is in Jesus Christ and in his kingdom. We are all children of God first, no matter what gender we are. Maybe you don't fit the standard that society has put on what a man or woman should be. Maybe you aren't the strongest guy out there. Maybe you don't like watching sports. 
But that does not mean you could not be an incredible man of God. What about Jacob from the Old Testament? Jacob was commonly thought of as feminine by the people in his life. Because, of, because just like our society now, Jacob was being compared to, with Esau. Esau liked to hunt. Jacob was domestic. Esau was hairy. Jacob was smooth. Esau was close to his dad. Jacob was close to his mother. But guess what? Jacob wrestled with God. He was still a man, no matter what generalizations people made about him. So maybe you don't exactly fit into what society expects you to be. But if you follow the word of God and live it out, that is when you are a true man or woman of God. What does God say a man or woman is supposed to be like scripturally? In Psalms chapter 37, verses 23 and 24, we get some direction on what a real man looks like. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his ways. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. And if you want direction on what a virtuous, godly woman looks like, go home and read all of Proverbs chapter 31. In closing, I'm going to list some qualities or identities that define us as children of God. And I want you to listen to this list and pick one quality or identity that is the most important to you. And I have the verses beside these identities if you're taking notes. This is your identity. You are accepted. You are chosen. You are free. You are forgiven. You are a new person. You are a child of God. You are made in God's image. You belong to Jesus. Jesus offers you a new life. You are a citizen of heaven. You are protected by God. You are part of something important. God loves you no matter what. God is with you. You are God's special creation. You are precious to God. You are rescued. God has a plan for your life. God listens to you. God gives you strength. You are an heir of God. You are a part of God's family. You are saved. God is taking care of you. Jesus gives you true joy. You are blessed. Jesus gave himself for you. God knows you. You are treasured by God. And you are complete in Christ. That is your identity. And this should be the message when we're talking to someone who is struggling with homosexuality or any temptation, we should be showing them their identity in Christ. I appreciate your kind attention, and I pray we can all benefit from this study. Thank you. If you like this sermon, do three things for me. Give it a thumbs up below, click the subscribe button, and share it with a friend either on social media or text. This helps the channel grow. It helps the word get out there. It's something really easy that you can do to affect the spreading of the gospel. This has been the Chapel Grove Church of Christ. Visit our website at chapelgrovechurch.com. We'll see you next time.